In this video, I'm going to show you the right way to create the Adamski effect in Luminar Neo. This effect has been popularized by the photo impressionist Josh Adamski. A lot of people have asked me how we recreate it, and it's actually quite simple. However, at the end, I'm going to share an often overlooked key ingredient that can make or break the success of your final image. So we know what we're aiming for. Let's take a quick look at Josh Adamski's work. In its most basic form, the Adamski technique appears as a whip pan i.e. motion blur along the horizontal or vertical axis. The next level up from that involves adding an object which exists in the environment but is unaffected by that blur. Josh often introduces more visual interest by varying the direction of those blurs. And in some of his work, we're treated to a visual feast where he incorporates multi-directional blurs along with a subject within that environment. And all of this is harmonized through a bold palette and often very vibrant colors. And it's this level that we're going to be aiming at and achieve by the end of the video. All right, let's get into it. To create our blurring effect in Luminar Neo, it's super simple. We're gonna go into the creative section, open up blur, and we want to choose the motion blur effect. We can grab the amount slider and move that up. And as you can see, we have a left to right motion effect. So a before and after. But if we want to change that angle to top to bottom, we just grab that angle slider and move that up to 90, obviously representing 90 degrees. So at zero, we have a left to right, and all the way at the top or the bottom, we have 90 degrees. So for the background blur effect, it's as easy as that, but we wanna keep the subject in focus. So let me show you how to do that. So along the bottom, I'm gonna click the film strip icon and come to a different photo. So let's work on this one. Again, come to edit, and we're going to come to the blur section, motion blur, and crank that amount up as our starting point. Now again, I want to go top to bottom, and as we look at the before and after, we can see that everything is being affected. So all we need to do is remove this effect from our character here. Several ways we could do that, we could use the AI mask to isolate the human subject, and as we apply the mask, you can see that we have the blurring over the person, but not the background. We want the opposite of that, which is really easy to do with the masking. We need to come to the mask actions, and we just want to invert that mask. So now we have the blurring on the background, but not on the person, before and after. Now this result is okay, but there's a few issues with this approach, and we're gonna solve those as the video goes on. But for now, one of the main things I would like to see is more blur, you know? Let's double down on the blur. Let me show you how we do that. Because I know what you might be thinking, well, we've pushed the amount all the way to 100, so we've already maxed out this tool. But of course, don't forget, we can apply Luminar Neo's tools multiple times. So in the edit stack, currently, we only have one motion blur applied. So we can apply this effect many times over. So let's come back to the creative section, come to blur and just do the same thing again. Motion, 100%, turn it to 90, and now we've got a doubling down of that effect by blurring the already blurred layer. So before and after with that additional blur, or before and after all the way back to the beginning. And if we didn't want that effect to apply to the subject again, we would need to come back into the mask and erase that effect from this guy. So this time I'll just do that with a brush just to show you how we can do it with that approach as well. Nice and easy before and after, but coming in and remasking this guy every single time is not really ideal. We can copy and paste the blur if we want to. However, I'm gonna show you a better way to do it as the video goes on. So before and after, we've now got a third effect of that. And if you did want to use one of the masks from before, all you need to do is come into the masking section from that first blur that we applied. And if we show that mask, we can see that. We're gonna copy that mask. We're gonna to come to this blur effect that we created last of all, come to the masking, and we can paste this mask over the top. So now we have all three blurs with a mask applied, before and after, before and after. Now I just want to point out an issue that I have with this particular image. If we compare it to that original one, where we blurred the photo in the same vertical direction, if you look at all of the markings through this photo, they all move top to bottom in a nice up and down fashion. Now we've tried to do the same thing here, and if you look around the center of the frame, that's what we've got going on. The lines go up and down, but towards the edge of the frame, where the tilt of the camera has caused this convergence of what should be 
dead straight lines at the side of our photo, they start to tilt inwards. We see that a lot with architecture where we tilt our camera up. It's not ideal for this effect because we don't get that lovely up and down motion going on. The blur direction is kind of fighting against that tilt of the camera. And so it's not quite as visually pleasing as a dead straight up and down or a dead straight left to right. Now in this version that I worked on before hitting record, if we look at the before, and the after, you can see that we've got the multi-directional effect going on. We've got the vertical blurring in the upper part of the image, and we've got a left to right horizontal blurring in the bottom part of the image. Again, very easy to do. And if we look at the subject as well, I've created a more sort of painterly look to her as well. And that's another effect that you'll often see applied in Josh Adamski's work, a sort of more painterly approach to the character rather than a photographic representation. So now we've got all the basics down, let's do a more complex version using layering and we'll bring in all the different aspects that make up the Adamski technique. This folder houses some photos that I thought would be ideal candidates for the Adamski technique. And it's this photo that we're gonna work on here and end up with something along the lines of this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create a virtual copy so I leave my original intact. I'm gonna come into the editing section. And so far I've just done a quick develop raw on this photo to take it from this to this, this is gonna be our starting point. And the first thing I'd like to do is just clean this image up. So in the catalog view, I'm going to access gen arrays and see if we can't get rid of some of these street signs. So all I need to do is paint over the areas that I want gone. I'm gonna to come to arrays, click that and let Luminar do its calculations. And if we move our mouse out of the screen, we can see what it's created for us and always use the backslash key to see the before and the after. And if we're happy, we move on. Before painting a new section, you always want to reset the selection because we are limited to the number of pixels that are generated for us. And so if we can work in smaller areas and then hit erase, the result that we get back is gonna be of higher quality. Again, reset the selection and move on. We definitely wanna get rid of this guy in the background here. So we'll get rid of the shopping bag, get rid of him. And if there's a shadow cast from objects in your scene, you want to get rid of those as well. I'll follow the same process, but just speed this part up for you. So we've taken the photo from that to this, and you might think that's where we want to be for adding this blur to the background. However, it's not. We actually want to remove the subject as well. As long as we have the original so we can bring her back, we'll be fine. But we want to get rid of her so that the blur effect isn't actually blurring her, it's just blurring the background. So again, we're gonna to come to generate and we're just gonna paint over the subject. Now we don't need to be too worried or concerned about what is generated in the background. It just has to be close enough. So I'm gonna hit erase. So because I've removed quite a large area here, you can see that the resolution is by no means perfect or what we would want if we were leaving this as is as part of our final image. But it doesn't matter because we're gonna be blurring all of this. So now we have a background plate. So we just need to save it. It's gonna to go to our generative creations folder that Luminar sets up by default. We just wanna drag it and put it into the same folder that we were working in before. So now we have our original, and we have a version with the background elements removed. At this point, we could work on either of these photos. I'm going to work on this one because it gives us access to our model. And now all we need to do is add the generative creation as a layer. And so we double click it, make sure that the opacity is set to 100. And so now we have two layers. If I hide this, we see our original. And if I show it, we see that we want this as the background. So I'm gonna drag it down, hide our original, and now with this background layer, we're going to blur that in two directions. So for maximum flexibility, what I'm gonna do is duplicate this layer again, and then we can blur one layer in one direction, one in the other, and then we can mask it back in where we want. So I'll come to blur, motion blur, crank the amount up to 100, and we're gonna change the angle. Again, I feel like this is nowhere near enough blur from this to this. So what I'm gonna do is reaction that tool several times and quickly apply that. That's the third iteration. Let's go for a fourth, and maybe for good measure, let's go for a fifth as well. And so if I hide that layer, we can see the background as it was and show the layer, and now we can see the vertical blurring. I'm temporarily going to hide this layer while we do a similar thing to the layer below. This time we're gonna go with the same kind of blur, but we're going to go in a left to right direction. So motion blur, just crank the amount to 100. The default angle is perfect. 
that signifies a left to right horizontal blur. And so we're just going to keep compounding this effect over and over again until we get the effect that we're after. And now we have our left to right blur, which is what I'm going to use for the floor. And I'm going to reintroduce the layer above, but only in this top half. And so what we want to do is just mask this effect in only where we want it. So a linear gradient would be perfect for this. I'm going to click and drag down so we'll get a tapering of that effect. So once we're happy with the mask, we just need to exit it and we will see the result. So hiding the layer shows all of that horizontal movement of the layer below. And now as we show this layer, that introduces that vertical top to bottom effect. Now, if we come back to the top layer and reveal that, we can see our original photo, which includes our model. We just want to show her. So we'll come into the masking section and the easiest way to select her is with mask AI and hopefully it's going to detect human. We can select her and there we go. It's not a perfect mask, but we can clean it up. It's got us pretty close and we can now just move into the paintbrush tool. And wherever we click and start painting, we're just going to reveal our model in full effect. And if there's some areas where we've got a bit of bleed around the edge here, just switch the erase mode and we can use the scroll wheel on our mouse to zoom in nice and tight and then start to remove the mask from those areas. OK, so we've taken our original photo and turned it into this with the Adamski effect, but there's more that we can do. So I mentioned creating a more painterly look for our model. So let's see if we can't do that. The first thing I'd like to do is just duplicate this layer so that if I make a mistake or I'm not happy with my result, I can always go back to that original layer. So a really unique tool for creating a painterly look is to uh, use the Structure AI tool, but in a negative way. So if I reduce the amount, you would hope that that would create a more painterly look to our model before and after. Now it's just softened off some of the textures in her skin, so it's pretty good. However, this tool is actually designed to ignore humans. It doesn't want to destroy the detail in humans. So a better way to approach this is with the details tool and then coming in, grabbing the small details and just starting to reduce those, which is going to destroy some of that texture, giving it a smoother, more painterly quality. And we can do the same with the medium and the large as well. However, you want to be careful going too far, too heavy handed with those large details, because at this point, it's actually the form that starts to get destroyed, not just those textural details. So if I double click to reset that, it brings back just a little bit of detail so we can have our before and after. So how far you take that effect is entirely up to you. Sometimes what I like to do with these kind of effects is put them where I want them and then just mask them in with my strength set to 50%, so I get half and half of the effect. So what is that issue that I mentioned earlier that I commonly see people do when they're trying to create the Adamski effect? Well, it's the separation between the subject and the background. Even though that we've got uh, an impressionistic background, we still want our subject to feel grounded within that scene. And because we've blurred the background, the shadow that grounds the subject often gets destroyed. So what I would like to see is that shadow reintroduced. So let's do that now. So the first thing I'd like to do is create a flat image from all the layers that we've been working on. So to do that, if we have the top layer selected, we just hold the shift key and then click on the bottom layer. That's going to select all the layers. We can right click and then just merge those layers. The purpose of that is that we can now work globally on this photo as a whole. So for example, if I were to hide that layer and let's say I wanted to apply an effect, doesn't matter which one, let's say I wanted to brighten up the whole photo and I grab the exposure slider and push it up, it's only going to affect the thing that appears on that layer, in this case, the model. So if we want to apply an effect to the whole thing, we can't. That is why we've created a brand new layer that is a composite of all of the layers underneath. So now I can come down to the professional section where the dodge and burn tool lives. Uh, you won't actually see this tool if you're not making money from your photography. So we're going to come to the darken mode. We're going to go set the strength relatively low because this is an effect that we want to build up in stages. I'm going to use the left bracket key to reduce the size of my brush. And I'm just going to paint over the shadow that was there. I'm going to do a couple of passes and make it more intense closer to the subject. And then we can have the before and after. And you can probably see if I toggle the before and after of this tool, one of my big bugbears with this tool 
is that not only does it darken down the pixels, but it's also intensifying the color, which isn't what we want. So there are workarounds to this, but for this case, what I'm gonna do is just use a desaturation layer and then just paint that in over the overly saturated component of the shadow. All right, before and after. So now if I hide this layer and show it, you can see how that shadow really helps to ground our subject. But now let's add some finishing touches. Let's do some enhance AI, a little bit of accent AI, just to increase that intensity of the photo. How about a little bit of vignette just to bring our viewer's attention closer towards the center of our subject there. Before and after, maybe a little too intense. Let's just drop it back a little bit. Yep, I'm happy with that. Let's jump into the creative section and add one of my favorite tools, Mystical. Oh, I haven't used that for a while. Let's crank that up. Let's see the before and after. A lovely dreamy quality added there. And then another thing that's synonymous with a lot of Joshua Adamski's work is a real heavy influence of saturation and vibrance. So if I grab the saturation slider and bump that up, you can see all that color intensifies but it's making her skin just a little bit too orange. So a better way to deal with that is to reset that and use the vibrant slider instead. That way you get all the lovely saturation that you got before, but the skin tones are left more intact. So here's our before and our after. Okay, let's see where we came from and where we got to. So on the left, the original raw photo, and on the right, we've got the Adamski effect applied to that photo. Before, and after, before and after. So that is how you can create the Adamski technique. But my recommendation to you is use this merely as an influence to guide your own creative vision. Josh Adamski's already done this. You just don't wanna be copying someone else's work. You wanna innovate. So stand on his creative shoulders and add to it something that is your own. If you'd like to learn all of my photo editing techniques, right from beginner all the way through to advanced, I've got a link in the description to my entire Luminar Neo training course. It's 18 hours of top quality content, even if I do say so myself. But I would love to see you in the course if you're interested in taking your photo editing to that next level. If not, no worries, I'll see you in the next video, which is popping up right there. Thank you for watching, bye-bye for now.